And what I want to do in this talk is to approach this question, well, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, the idea, of course, ultimately is to make the connectome work in the functional sense. So people imagine, and there are lots of skeptics, of course, people imagine, though, that we might be able to put the connectome into a computer model, put all the neurons that we've mapped into a computer model, put all the connections between them into the, into the model, and just run the model, and it will produce accurate behavior, functional behavior. <coughs> So what I want to do in this talk is to approach that same question, which actually we've um, been working on with in simple systems, mostly invertebrate systems, for many, many years um, <coughs> in a somewhat historical way, following up uh, Roman's introduction, and um, ask the question whether the connectome is really sufficient to do the job. Okay, we got Got slides, finally. All right, good. So this is a slide that you don't need to see. Um, <clears throat> so those of us working on simple systems, invertebrate systems, um, as I said, have faced this question already. And there are, as Roman pointed out in his introduction, Connect, known connectomes for some simple uh, networks in invertebrates, um, such as C. elegans and the stomatogastric ganglion of uh, lobsters and crabs, due mainly to the work of Eve Bodder and her uh, colleagues and intellectual descendants. <coughs> so we can actually, and it, this has been done already, ask the question, if we put these networks into a computer, in particular the stomatogastric ganglion network, which arguably is the most complete connectome, um, <clears throat> if we put that into a computer and run it, will it produce the um, pattern of behavior that the real system produces? And the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> and in this talk, I want to highlight some of the pieces that are still missing from the connectome. Basically, I take the view that um, the connectome is the basis for performing that, carrying out that project, but it's, it's a it's necessary component, necessary basis, but it's not a sufficient, um, it's not a, quite sufficient to uh, accomplish the task, and I want to highlight some of the pieces that still need to be added to the connectome to make it possible to perform that task. <coughs> So here we have a basic wiring diagram or connectome. Um, <clears throat> and I want to talk about a little bit about uh, reconfiguration by synaptic plasticity, which is well known in the somatogastric ganglion. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about equivalent uh, connectivity patterns. And in particular, I want to focus on neuromodulation. <clears throat> so uh, reconfiguration on, by synaptic plasticity um, enables the connectome to be divided up into separate uh, networks, or conversely, separate networks to be joined together. Um, and this can be done on a dynamical basis from one motor act to the next in a, in a rhythmic behavior, for instance, such that the network that's carrying out each, each act is different. <clears throat> um, I want to show you some examples of equivalent connectivity patterns. Um, some of this, this work actually, again, comes from the uh, lab of EMOD originally, uh, originally by Astrid Prince and then more recently by others in EMOD's lab. So here we have a computer model, actually, um, which uh, shows <coughs> the same two computer models, two connectomes, which show the same pattern of um, activity, yet they have completely different uh, <coughs> connectivity patterns. And they have, they have different synaptic strengths between the different neurons, and they also have different intrinsic properties, uh, as shown by these uh, <coughs> conductances of the different ion channels in the neurons. So we have, <coughs> we have um, different connectomes performing the same function. Conversely, we can also show that the same connectome performs very different patterns of activity. Um, for instance, in um, different conditions of synaptic plasticity and neuromodulation. So the connectome is a very plastic thing. 
It's not a unique thing. <coughs> this is, this th down here shows some experimental evidence. So as I said, this was a model, but here is some experimental evidence uh, for the same thing using dynamic clamp, where uh, the uh, connectome, the wiring diagram, was perturbed through dynamic clamp approaches to change the uh, synaptic strengths. And here we have four different uh, effectively connectomes <coughs> with different synaptic strengths. They produce the same patterns of activity. So this is an experimental demonstration of the same thing that Astrid showed in the model here. <coughs> now, uh, really, I want to focus, as I said, on, this, on neuromodulation in this talk. And here is the picture that Roman already showed uh, from, of the stomatic gastric ganglion, showing all the different uh, modulators, all the different transmitters, hormones that impinge on this network, this basic connectome, and changes patterns of activity. <coughs> Again, in C. elegans, the other animal that I uh, alluded to already, that where the connectome is known, we have numerous neuropeptide genes, modulated genes, coding many, many different neuropeptide modulators. Uh, it's ironic that in the simplest organisms, such as uh, the crab and lobster, which is not that simple, but C. elegans certainly is a simple organism, uh, where the connectome is relatively simple, we have the greatest, possibly the greatest uh, richness of neuromodulators that then change the way the connectome produces uh, functional activity. <coughs> And there may be, in my view, it's still an open question whether invertebrates and vertebrates solve the same problems in different ways or the same way. And this, this question has been around for decades also. <coughs> but it's certainly true that this richness of neuromodulation is not unique to invertebrates. We have here um, uh, the respiratory network in the work of Nino Ramirez, again showing different um, <coughs> neuromodulatory inputs onto this basic network. <coughs> Here we have an example from the work of uh, Mike Selmo of neuromodulation uh, impinging on pyramidal cell output, and changing, its, changing the output in the brain, of the vertebrate brain. <coughs> and this shows also that uh, neuromodulators are one of the uh, <coughs> ways in which synaptic plasticity can happen. They, they mediate. We modulate, but even mediate synaptic plasticity, both presynaptically and postsynaptically, um, <coughs> in the vertebrate brain. So this is not these um, examples that I'm showing you from the invertebrates really will probably translate to vertebrates, although that's an, still an open question to what extent the importance is the same. <coughs> Neuromodulators can, as I already mentioned change the activity of the network. Here we have somatogastric ganglion uh, output uh, under the conditions of different modulators being added. And you can see the same network uh, is com producing completely different uh, rhythmic patterns of activity in different conditions of modulation. <coughs> and this is a very common observation in, in invertebrates and presumably in vertebrates as well. Um, finally, I want to <coughs> stress communication by neuromodulators. This is uh, an interesting point where <coughs> neuromodulators can link um, neurons that are not actually linked by the basic connectome at all. Um, <coughs> if the neuromodulators are, are released from one neuron, let's say this neuron here, and travel through the uh, um, interneuronal medium to impinge on to act on another neuron that has receptors for that neuromodulator, then we, it establishes a link, a communication link between those two neurons that is not represented in the, in the original static wiring diagram. <coughs> and so th then it becomes a question of how, um, <coughs> how far these modulators can travel. And the point has been made that a lot of neuromodulators, especially neuropeptides, travel through volume transmission rather than point-to-point -point, uh, <coughs> connections between well-structured synapses, as in the, as in the traditional connectome, um, how far the, the, the neuromodulator can travel and where the receptors for that neuromodulator are. <coughs> and different, so we have um, um, 
patterns of communication established in a neural network that is through these biochemical pathways um, that are really unsuspected if you just look at the static connectome. <coughs> this is, I put this in for uh, Paul Katz's sake, um, <coughs> showing that, um, making the point that extrinsic modulation and intrinsic modulation are the two kinds of modulation that uh, can occur. Extrinsic just modulation is where the uh, modulator comes from outside the network and can affect the network from outside. Here we have an intrinsic modulation where the actual elements of the network release the neuromodulator when they're active. And in both of these cases, this kind of communication can be established. <coughs> it then becomes important exactly what the extracellular matrix looks like. Uh, in the brain, obviously, it's going to be complicated by this dense packing of neurons, uh, glial cells, blood vessels, what have you. And so the neuroanatomy that's, again, independent of the connectome, is going to have a great effect on <coughs> what kind of communication through this biochemical network will, will occur. And that's probably responsible for findings such as this in the somatogastric ganglion, where if you just apply exogenous modulators to the different neurons of the somatogastric ganglion, you find that they have responses in some, to some modulators, but not others in different combinations here. But if you actually release the modulators endogenously from the neuron that normally releases them, you find a different um, pattern of responses to those neuromodulators. So this is probably due to neuroanatomical constraints of this, this sort, even in the crustacean stomatogastric ganglion. <coughs> Here we have a, an example of computation carried out, very simple computation admittedly, but computation carried out by um, these biochemical networks. <coughs> In this case, this is, this is from the work of Nick Dale, um, where he studied uh, swimming in the Xenopus embryo. Uh, swimming is controlled, the duration of swimming rather, is controlled by the bursting, the length of the bursts of these, this neuron, as shown here. Uh, this is where swimming starts, this is where swimming, swimming stops, and the length of this burst is controlled by a complicated, somewhat complicated uh, array of uh, extracellular biochemical events where ATP is released from the neuron, so this is an intrinsic modulator of a sort. It's then degraded to ADP, AMB, and adenosine. Each of these, in particular ATP itself and adenosine, has an effect on potassium and calcium channels, and there is uh, some kind of structure to this network where feedforward inhibition uh, controls the duration of the burst. So if you modulate, this is again a, uh, a computer model now, but this is a real, da real data here. Um, if you modulate the uh, strength of this inhibition, you change the duration of the burst. So there is memory and there is computation that's performed by this, this extracellular network. And there are much more complicated examples that probably uh, can be cited. <coughs> Finally, I want to uh, show you uh, the system that uh, I think Roman was expecting me to talk about most of the time in my talk. Um, <coughs> uh, the Plesia feeding system, here's an Plesia feeding on seaweed. Uh, we've studied, uh, and, and others have studied for many, many years, the musculature, uh, the buccal musculature that performs these feeding movements. Um, there are many muscles and many neurons. Uh, and <coughs> each of these neurons has a conventional transmitter, but also has many intrinsic uh, trans uh, modulators, such as shown here in this column here. Um, <coughs> here is uh, one muscle that we've uh, highlighted, one muscle that we've worked on, the ARC muscle, controlled by two neurons, B15 and B16. And here is the network of actions of these modulators. and superimposed on the uh, sort of traditional connectome. Traditional connectome would be just these two neurons, B15 and B16, um, both of which release acetylcholine and make the muscle contract. So the muscle here is taken as the output element of this, this network. I mean, it could have been a neuron as well. In fact, a lot of uh, very similar things occur in the central nervous system of plesia as well. This muscle just happens to be a convenient output element. Uh, so 
the connectome, the traditional connectome B15, B16, releasing acetylcholine onto muscle, very, very simple. Yet, there is also this very complicated network of effects of these modulatory cotransmitters, in this case, uh, just two of them are shown, SCP and myomodulin, through different uh, second messenger systems, uh, effects on uh, ion channels, change the uh, uh, relaxation rate and the contraction size of these contractions such that each modulator has a different effect on the shape of the contraction. So if you take that as the output element of the network, you can see we produce very different patterns of contraction, patterns of activity in a nervous system. It would be uh, depending on which modulator is released and um, also <coughs> what other modulators are being co-released because if we then combine the modulators, STP and my modulator in this case, in all possible ways, we can see how that space of modulator inputs projects into the output space of the relaxation rate and contraction size uh, effect. And we can see it covers a two-dimensional space in which many, many points can be reached by combinations of the modulators, but not the individual modulators alone. And here are some relaxation phases shown uh, from different uh, uh, muscles under different conditions of uh, STP and myomodulin uh, modulation. So <coughs> we have a, um, this is still a fairly linear uh, network actually, but we already have the idea that multiple modulators jointly will uh, change the network activity um, and the output of the network in ways that individual modulators could not. So we have combinations of modulators that become important. And presumably, uh, certainly that's true in the plesia, but presumably in most of the other systems, such as somatogastric ganglion and vertebrate systems, modulators will be, will be released as cocktails. There's gonna be a cocktail of neuromodulators, not just one modulator at a time. And it's the cocktail that's gonna affect, it's gonna determine the final activity. <coughs> Finally, I wanna make the point that <coughs> the, um, I haven't mentioned dynamics yet, so I wanna mention dynamics. Uh, these effects in aplysia and elsewhere in other systems have powerful dynamics which differ from each other for the different effects. So some are slow, some are fast, and in particular this um, creates a history dependence uh, for the system. So this is, these are some of the elements in that network that you just saw uh, up here in the CPG and here in the muscle, and these, the size of these arrows indicates the correlation from one cycle to the next. This is a rhythmic cyclical behavior, so we can measure uh, the, these effects <coughs> for many, many cycles. Actually, what was done in this model was to feed in real feeding behavior, which is very variable, over a couple of hours. So there are hundreds of cycles, and these are just the correlations between one cycle and the next. And you can see that uh, the CPG has some effect on the current cycle, in particular on the fast effect, the potassium current effect, but much more powerful are the effects of the previous cycle on the current cycle. So we have carryover of history, uh, carryover of the activity, depending on what the nervous system has done before. And this is something that, again, the static connectome, the traditional connectome does not represent very well. <coughs> I wanna put in a plug for some recent work that we've been doing. I've already mentioned that um, combinations of neuromodulators are going to be important, um, and very often the combination of the neuromodulators has unexpected effects on the, the network. As I said, that one I showed you was relatively linear, but others are not, where the combination of, of modulators suddenly produces the bifurcation in the, in the behavior of the system. One modulator alone, or the other modulator alone, let's say that's just two modulators for the sake of argument, <coughs> will produce um, rather expected patterns of activity, but the two together will produce some completely radically different uh, pattern of activity. So how do we study this experimentally? So traditionally, the experiments is to take the network and apply the modulator exogenously. And that works up to a point. But what if you have a cocktail of modulators and you want to understand the relationship between the, the modulators uh, in that cocktail with respect to the activity, the output of the network? Um, so 
you can try them pairwise or triplet-wise, but nobody's actually done that very systematically because there's an infinite number of experiments, astronomical number of experiments you have to do to actually test all possible pairs, all possible triplets. So what we've done is, um, um, oops, is develop a, a method that uses basically um, block uh, experimental design approach where we can put on cocktails of modulators where, <coughs> this is showing it for some hypothetical uh, number of modulators at different concentrations, where in each cocktail uh, um, sample, uh, the, the modulator of interest, or the pair of modulators of interest, or the triplet of modulator of interest is combined with all uh, others over the whole set of uh, cocktails. So basically, we have a block uh, experimental design, and this radically reduces the number of experiments that we actually need to carry out, as shown here at the bottom, uh, to get at some, in, at least initial screen of which neuromodulators, which neuromodulator combinations are going to produce nonlinear effects that perhaps lead to radically different changes in the behavior of the system. <coughs> so, um, I want to just summarize what I've said. Um, really want to make the point that the connectome, as this work in invertebrates, simple so-called simple systems has shown, um, neuromodul uh, the, the connectome is necessary but not sufficient to understand how the brain works. So yes, of course it's necessary. We really would, we will, we will be much further and we already are much further in the invertebrate systems uh, when we have some kind of connectome to work with. Uh, but it's not enough. We can't just plug the connectome into a computer and run the computer and it produces behavior and we're done. We understand how the brain works. That's not going to turn out to be the case. I think in vertebrates, as it has not turned out to be the case in invertebrates. <coughs> I, I kind of think of this as, as analogous to the Human Genome Project, which I think has been mentioned already, um <coughs> where, again, the idea was we, if we understand the whole genome, if we have the whole genome mapped and we have, we can basically read off all the instructions for making the, the organism, and that, that'll be very simple. Uh, and the, hum the human genome and you know, genomes of other species have turned out to be fundamental for advancing science, but not in that way yet. Uh, because between the genome and the, um, the, the, the genotype and the phenotype, there is a very complicated network of cellular interactions that mediates the translation from the genome to the, the phenotype. So I think it's going to turn out to be very similar for the uh, connectome project, where <coughs> we, will, we need to know, we need to understand the connectome, we need to have it in front of us, and the connectome in, in a way that I've tried to show you in the invertebrate systems actually suggests what else we need to know and incorporate into the computer models in order to make the thing work, neuromodulation, uh, synaptic plasticity, dy dy dynamics, and so on. Um, so there is a complicated network between the two levels, um, and we need to understand that network, or at least build that network into our models in order to make the whole thing work. <coughs> and um, I've talked about synaptic plasticity a little bit, not very much, equivalent connective patterns, but mostly neuromodulation. Um, so, and I, really the most interesting idea there is neuromodulation. Neuromodulation can certainly change these, these two things and others uh, in the network, but uh, most interesting idea to my mind is that there is communication by neuromodulators that is independent, superimposed on the, the connectome, the, the static wiring diagram, um, where the neuromodulators establish channels of, of communication between the neurons that are not in the static connectome and <coughs> it's these, um, both in terms of uh, structure, uh, neuroanatomical structure, location, and dynamics, these, these channels are delocalized from the connectome. And they alone, of course, in conjunction with the connectome, but even alone, they can store memories, process information, and perform computations. So I want to thank some of my uh, past collaborators and present collaborators, and thank NIH and NINDS, NSF for funding 
uh, this work. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hi. I was wondering if it will be possible somehow to have a model of the computation of the um, extracellular network by, I don't know, maybe taking into account uh, dissociation constants or um, speed of, of reactions uh, between different uh, neuromodulators or how this can be, uh, how this can have um, a model, like computationally. Right. So yes, that's that would be the idea. So the the the, the failure of these uh, simple point-to-point -point connectomes uh, suggests that you need something like that, and you need to incorporate that into your model to w make it work. And of course, biochemical models like that exist. Problem with that biochemical model is that it's three-dimensional, and you know, delocalized in space and time. It's not a simple connection from A to B that you can basically just draw a, an arrow. In the, in, the, in the graph. Um, you need to know a lot more about where the neuromodulator goes, dissociation constants, uh, it, the effects of the neuromodulator on other components in the network and so on. So it becomes a much more complicated problem to do that, but in principle that is perfectly doable and it should be done. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, very interesting talk. I think you made a very convincing uh, case that uh, simple structural connection is not enough, and we need to know also the uh, dynamics, neuromodulation, and uh, things like that. But I think it's uh, interesting to consider, even if we know all of this, will that be uh, enough? Because the interesting case to consider is um, uh, the lesson we learned from a study, the artificial neural network. Mm -hmm. In that case, we know structure, we know dynamics, we know pret pretty much everything. But still, uh, in many cases, like uh, especially the early like uh, multilayer uh, perception, it's still black box. It's still very hard to explain in detail how does the network work. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, th y there are other, well, depends what you mean by explain. I mean, explain in terms of a computer model is, is has its own problems, obviously. Um, uh, computer models tend to be rather brittle, and uh, probably related to some of the things I talked about. You know, they, they work fine for the, your data, but then they break down if you try to model other situations. So that's, that's, that's a limitation of computer uh, modeling and understanding also. Um, but beyond that, yes, there are, uh, the things I talked about are not, you know, the b be all and end all. I mean, there, there are many more things that I think we will need to know. We just don't know what they are yet, as Donald Rumsfeld said. Yeah, okay, <coughs> thank you. I just think probably it's also important to con consider that what type of question that we can ask, or uh, as you mentioned, what type, what is understanding that, uh, um, what, um, what do we mean if we say try to understand the nature, right? Right. So there's, you know, again, that is, you know, the argument between computer modeling, kind of brute force computer modeling, yes, we can reproduce the pattern, but do we really understand it? And understanding, which usually for, for most people that means reducing it to some sim simpler conceptual, perhaps, or computer model. Uh, um, and both are valid. Um, I, I tend to be on the simpler side rather than the complicated side because they're, for one thing, we haven't been able to make the complicated models work. But even if we do, I'm not entirely sure the understanding will emerge suddenly from, from the, the, the model network. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next speaker 